access into grace. You've got to have that door. If you don't have that door, you'll never, you can all your life, I'm convinced, I've been on the road a long time, I'm convinced there are hundreds and thousands of people that sit in what we call the church that the door is closed in the grace. They cannot find grace with God. They stumble, they err, they meet obstacles, they can't overcome, they can't conquer because they never get to the door of faith in the grace where they can stand. And people say, why did they come into the church and they're there a few days and gone? Why would they be there a few weeks and they're gone? Why would they be around for a little while and they're gone? Why years later, they've been sitting there for years, you think, they're part of the church. And suddenly all of, they become blind. They can't even see where they are. They can't even see their spirit. They, can't, they don't even know what spirit they're of. Um, and, and they give up. They just go back into the world or they go into Babylon. Um, and, 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 and someone said, I never thought they would do that, go into Babylon or go into the world. Um, see, I, I know that I would not do that. I would not do that. And I say that not boastfully, but by cause, I'm standing in grace. Having done all to stand, stand therefore. How do you stand? You can't stand, except you stand in grace. And you can't have the door and into grace unless you have faith. Faith is believing that God will do that which is not seen. And you can apply that to every tribulation you go through. Don't get in the spirit and let the enemy talk you into saying, I'm hopeless, I'm helpless, can't work this out, nothing good will come from this, that it's all said and done. Because you're not standing in faith. But if you stand in faith, you say, I don't know how it's going to be, I don't know how God will do it, I don't know what he'll do to get me there. I just know the Lord has said to me, move, or go that way, or do that, or obey me. And you don't know how it's going to be done. It looks impossible. Uh, I like that little saying, we are the people that hear the inaudible, that see the invisible and believe the impossible. We are the people that hear the inaudible, that, that see the invisible, that believe the impossible. That's faith. Can't do that without faith, confidence, trust. God will do it. That's what Jesus said, Brother Hank. Uh -huh. Listen, say that again, Hank. That'll be good for the, for the church tonight. I've always said if I can't see it, hear it, touch it, feel it, it ain't there. That's what you said before you came to hell. Before I came to hell. If I can't see it, touch it, hear it, feel it, it ain't there. It ain't there. <laughs> That's right. That's the way the carnal man would think, isn't it? That's the way you would feel. But it's the opposite. Notice, God just reverses that all in you. And, and, and you may not see it, you may not hear it, you may not mm -hmm. feel it, uh, or the other one, hey, the chain, you had four of them there. But, but you touch it, but yet, I know my God is present in every situation. Paul said, all things work together, Romans 8, but all things work together for good to them that love the Lord who are the called, put that in there, who are the called according to his purpose. So that brings in the predestinated will of God in your life. Brother Ernest.
discussion I got when I was in the uh, seventh grade over in Palmetto Junior High with my biology teacher and uh, he gave me a failing grade. <laughs> I had quite a discussion with him about the existence of God and uh, he he didn't like being crossed. He didn't like, but I had enough of the scriptures. I stayed with him. He was a very smart man, very learned man. But I had enough of the scriptures that I could stay with him and the proponent, uh, being the proponent of, of the existence of God. Uh, all right. Now let's, Brother Bill. No, in per, uh, Second Thessalonians, the very first chapter, verse 4 and 5, if they'll put it on the board, first Thessalonians, I mean, Second Thessalonians, first chapter, 4 and 5, it says, So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith. <clears throat> In all your persecutions and your tribulation that you endure, it says, which is a manifest token of the righteousness, judge or the righteous judgment of God, that you may be kind of worthy of the kingdom of God that which you also suffer. So you got, you know, that's a manifest that's good. token. That's very good. Yeah, very good. That's very that nails it. That puts the nail in the uh, teachings right there that we're on. Um, that's just a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, the, the persecutions that you suffer. That's just a manifest token, uh, a sign of the righteous judgment of God. Why? That you may be counted worthy. It makes it valuable, doesn't it? Something valuable. You didn't get it for nothing. You're not going to heaven for nothing. You're not going to live forever for nothing. You're not going to obtain eternal life for nothing. Someone said, Jesus paid a price. I'm going to add to that. I paid a price. You'll pay a price. A little boy said, uh, I learned at the church, Jesus paid it all. He did in the phase of eternal life, eternal salvation, forgiveness of sin. I can do none of that. But what he requires of me is going to cost me. I'm going to surrender my life for his life. I'm going to surrender my world for his world. So it does cost. There is some cost attached to it uh, that we pay, uh, working out our salvation with fear and trembling. All right? Got the other picture in there, Roman 4 and 4, Brother Mauro. Well, it's Roman 1 and 4, verse 1 to 5, maybe. Uh, where it talks about what you just say, we got a debt to pay. And uh, of course, Jesus paid the debt that we he never owned. Uh, we got that song that we sang, you know. So right. He paid a debt that he never owned. Yeah, he, he never owed that debt. In no. chapter 4 in there of uh, Romans, he said, What shall we say then that Abraham, our father, has pertaining to the place? found question would if Abraham we are justified <coughs> by works he have word of to glory but not before God mm -hmm. for what say the scriptures Abraham believed God mm -hmm. and he was counted into him for righteousness for believing God now to him that worketh is to reward not to reckon of grace, but of the death. It's a death. But to him that worketh, add to that. But to him that worketh, that no. worketh not. But, but believe <coughs> on him that justified the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So in believing, you don't work that out. You just accept. There's no, no work involved of your 
carnal self, your carnal mind, plotting, planning, or figuring it out, or you're going to do it because of advantage. No, you just simply believe God as Abraham did, and it was counted to him for righteousness. If he could have worked it out by works, it would have been a debt that he paid, and God did not want that. He wanted Abraham to be uh, have righteousness, counted righteous because of his faith, just simply because of his faith. Uh, he believed God. God. God said, Abraham, I'm going to make a mighty nation out of you. Your seed will be as the stars of the sky, the sands of the sea, uh, innumerable. And he believed God. Though he was an elderly man, everything contrary to that, but he believed God. So we can see the justification of faith. Uh, verse 10, Isaiah 53 Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He had put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his day. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Oh, how beautiful that is that in the suffering of Christ, when he made his soul an offering for sin. Remember, I said, Christ did not guess about the plan of God. He was in the counsel of the Father, and he knew the plan of God. He knew he would have seed better than that of sons and daughters. The verse is that. We're near Isaiah. I can't pick it up right now where he said um, of the eunuch, let not the eunuch say that I'm a dry tree, see, but I'll give him a name better than that of sons and daughters. Um, I wanted to say it was Isaiah 55, but to six, but I don't believe it is. It's somewhere in where I'm, I'm around it, but uh, that, that scripture pertains to Christ. Let not the eunuch Christ had no natural children. Here is Isaiah 56 and 3. Neither let the son of the stranger that had joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, The Lord has utterly separated me from his people. In other words, don't, don't let uh, a child of God, the stranger that is joined to the Lord and becomes part of the holy nation, uh, don't let him say uh, that the Lord has utterly separated me from my past, my people, what I was, my generation, and bemoan it and groan about it? No, no neither, uh, he said, neither let the eunuch say. And Christ was the eunuch. He was the eunuch. He had no seed in the natural. He begat no sons in the natural our daughters, even though this bunch of junk that's being published in the paper right now, that they found evidence that Christ may have been married. Yeah. That's nothing more than hogwash. They, they can't prove it, even they admitted they can't prove it. They don't have to prove it to me. Uh, I know that he was a eunuch. Uh, he made himself a eunuch for the kingdom of God. Uh, made himself that, did not indulge in rearing children and the pleasure thereof. But he wasn't a dry tree. Right. He wasn't a dry tree. He produced, look at the fruit Amen. he's produced now for 2,000 years. Amen. Look at the fruit coming uh, from this tree of life. Christ the Lord. Right. My God. Hallelujah. Look at the fruit. Hallelujah. Bearing fruit. One generation after another. Thousands of years now, bearing fruit, a righteous seed coming from him. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear 
their iniquities, our Christ. Therefore, verse 12, therefore will I divide him, or I'll give him. Remember the father divided the goods to the prodigal son? Well, Christ was not the prodigal son. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great. How great did he divide him a portion with? All of the heavenly hosts bow down, hallelujah, to the Lamb. All of the hundreds, thousands of the very elect, 144,000 of the very elect, the thousands of 10,000 times 10,000 that will be his seed in the resurrection. Um, they, they bow down, hallelujah, to the Lamb. The, the earth will bow down. <coughs> Finally, every knee shall bow. Yes, every knee shall bow. Amen. And every tongue amen. shall come yes. My God, that thrills me. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Every knee. That's how, that's how great his portion is. Hallelujah. That's how great he is. He'll divide him a portion with a great. No monarch, no king ever ruled, ever lived that will have his greatness. Why, you could put Solomon with all of his glory in a little corner over there, like a little schoolboy, and set him down. My God, compared to Christ, praise the name of the Lord. Never, 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 never has glory been given. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Be strong in the Lord, in the power of his might. You know, if you're strong in the Lord, he'll divide his poor with you. Yes, amen. He'll divide his goods with you, uh -huh. his riches with you. Yeah, amen. If you're strong, yeah. if you're weak, you should have nothing. A weak man deserves what he gets. Amen. A weak woman deserves what she gets. Uh -huh. She gets nothing, nothing. But a strong man, a strong woman attains to the spoil, uh -huh. to the spoil. Praise our God. God. And, and I want to be, I want to be strong. Because I want some of the spoil of Christ. I want some of the reward of Christ. He's going to give out rewards. Christ is coming to give rewards out. And in the first resurrection, he will give rewards to his people. He'll give some 30, some 100, some 60. He'll give rewards to the righteous. He's going to do that. That's our... That's our prizes. That's our rights. And, and the scripture said, he, because he had poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors. Was he not? Yes, he was. They didn't number him as a righteous man. They numbered him. They, he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich. No one in Jerusalem after he died that we have record of except the pitiful women and the sanitarium and those weeping women that followed him. They, they, according to the scriptures, believed that he was the son of God. And the sanitarium, one lone, ungodly Roman man soldier said truly this was the son of God but oh it wasn't long he arose and the conquering strong followed him also somewhere it said something about did our hearts turn the road to Emmaus when they were they saw him they didn't know who he was Luke the 24th chapter they didn't know who he was. He was ministering to them from Isaiah and the Psalms and the prophets. And they, after they got to the house and sat down with him and he broke that bread in that peculiar way, he's still breaking that bread in a peculiar way. Amen. You'll know Christ when you see him breaking the bread. Amen. His word when it's broken Amen. in the hands of Christ, 
a ministry that breaks the bread in a peculiar manner, different than the Pharisee, the Sadducee, the Herodian. But they recognized him. They said, did not our hearts burn within us? While we were on the way, they, they finally knew it. Well, it's good to recognize him yes. whenever you do. All right. And however you do, recognize Christ. Amen. You may not recognize him at first, but don't fail to recognize him. Oh, yes. Know where he is. Know who he is in your life. So this, uh, th this is a very good, outstanding verse. And uh, we have a few more minutes. Let's go to Luke 13 and 33 in our study. Luke 13 and 33. Um, this is a very, very good study. I love this study. Study of Christ. And uh, nothing is dear or near to me. In the 13th chapter, the 33rd verse, um, we, we have this uh, sayings of Christ uh, that we, when we look at when we look at uh, this uh, he said they, they asked him let's go to verse 31 get the context the same day there came certain of the Pharisees saying unto him get thee out and depart hence for Herod will kill thee and it wasn't Herod. It wasn't Herod that killed Christ. Um, those Pharisees were plotting and planning. And he said unto them, Go you and tell that fox. <laughs> you know, the scriptures are one. We picture Jesus as being a very sober man that never had any humor about him and never spoke but, you know church channel church channel he, he really shows us something right? yeah. you go and tell that fox <laughs> <laughs> he, he called Herod a fox <laughs> someone said Jesus never did say anything naughty about anybody <laughs> well it wasn't sinful, but it was a little naughty <laughs> because it showed his humor. Because he just said, I, I'm going to refer to that fella. And he said, You tell him he's a fox. Well, I'm sure Herod didn't like that. Jesus knew his name. But Jesus said, You go and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out devils. And I do cures today and tomorrow. And the third day I shall be perfected. This has a lot of study and meaning in it. In fact, you could even bring an antitype out of his words there if you want to stretch it that far. If you want to just, just go into it uh, the third day. The third day. Um, we know, we know that we are now living parabolically and season-wise in the time, prophetic times. We're living in the third day. We have passed from the second day since Christ, B.C. Uh, A.D., and now we actually are in the overlapping interim period. <laughs> between the dispensation of the church and the kingdom. We're not in the kingdom yet. We're still in the foot part of, of the uh, time of the second day of the church. But yet, in this day, the third day, there will be perfection or maturity. And we'll reach the fullness of the measure of the statue of Christ, spoken of them, and come to the knowledge of the faith and the unity of the faith in the third day. Now, that's just a little thing to study on. That same synopsis of reason 
is used in Hosea 6. Come, let us return unto the Lord concerning the Israel, the Jew. Come, let us return unto the Lord. For though he has smitten us, he will heal us. Though he has torn us, he will bind us up. And in the second day, we will live, he will revive us the second day. So Israel has been revived in the second day. 1948, that's in the second day. Star of David, resurrected. Now that scripture was fulfilled in Hosea 6, that prophetic scripture. He will revive us in the second day. But in the third day, Israel will live. They will be established again as the chosen people of God in the 144,000 that are to be selected and elected of God. So then he uses that the third day. Again, I'm, I'm using the day there to show you that you can look at and get thoughts from. Now let's look at what Christ really meant. Uh, I'm using that only to stir your mind. And I, to behold, I cast out devils, and I do cures today and tomorrow. But the third day, the third day he's speaking of there, is the day that he came from the grave. He came from the grave at the close of three days and three nights. In the third day, he finished his sacrifice of the grave. Amen. In the third day, he finished his work of being the perfect Lamb of God. Mm. See, the third day, I will <coughs> be perfected. Amen. Today, I do cures. And uh, <coughs> today and tomorrow. And the third day, when the close of the third day came, three days, three nights, when that came, in the dawning of the fourth day, Christ was not in the tomb. Amen. He was perfected. He was a perfect sacrifice, fulfilling the perfect will of God. That's what Christ was saying here. And in the third day, I will be perfected. The finished work of the sacrifice of death, fulfilling Hebrews 2 and 14, for as much as the children, Hebrews 2 and 14, are partakers of flesh and blood, he himself likewise took part of the same, flesh and blood, that through death, sacrifice, through death, he might destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. So Christ, partaking of death, destroyed Satan that had the power of death for 4,000 years. Mm -hmm. For no man lived and did not die. Uh, what is that, Ecclesiastes 7 and 20? There is not a man that liveth and shall not see death. See, for all have sinned. Death reigned from Adam to Moses. Uh, for all have sinned. Uh, for by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And uh, so death was passed upon all, because all have sinned. Romans 5, 12, 13 there. So Christ finished that through death. He was perfected. The third day, I shall be perfect. Perfected. Nevertheless, verse 33, I must walk today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet perish out of Jerusalem. The prophet that he refers to here is the prophet that Moses spoke of in the book of Deuteronomy that God would raise up. He was the prophet that was not to 
perish out of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the holy city, the city of the great king, was to be where he would perish. He could not have perished in Galilee. In the predestinated, foreknown will of God, Christ could not have died in Galilee. He could not have died in Samaria. See, the plan of God is so precise and the predestinated will of God that you cannot, there's no laxity, there's no wavering. Uh, James, what is that, James 1 and 20, 1 and 13, 1 and 20, but every good gift come up down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variableness. There is no variableness. If God's people could study the scriptures, they would get out of this condition they're in of being wish-washy, being so easily moved, being, giving up so easily, being so temperamental because there's no variableness with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning in the Father, the Father of lights, God. So his exact will had to be done in Christ even to the prophet not being able to perish out of Jerusalem. Now, you, the reason I say this is because this scripture could not be true because there were many prophets that did not die in Jerusalem. Many prophets that didn't die in the city of Jerusalem. But yet Christ said no prophet should perish out of Jerusalem. He was the prophet that could not and would not perish out of Jerusalem. That was the exact center of God's will. That was the city of Zion. That was Mount Zion where he was to finish the work of grace. God was that exact. God was that exact. So the scripture opens up and then he said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings, and you would not. Behold, now here's the prophetic scripture that Christ gave Israel right here. He cut them right here. He separated them right here. He said, Behold, your house, the house of Israel, is left unto you desolate, that is, without the temple, without the sacrifice, left unto you desolate, without the altar, desolate. And verily I say unto you, you shall not see me until the time come when you shall say, blessed is he and come in the name of the Lord. Israel will see him again when they recognize that people, which is the Gentile, as the Gentile recognized Israel. See, God, the first shall be last. Jesus said, the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. God reversed. The Gentile had to see the Messiah in the Jewish ministry. Peter. Peter. They had to see Christ in Peter. Recognize the Messiah that they didn't know. They were strangers to. The household of Cornelius in Peter. In the stead of the Lord. In the name of the Lord. Peter went to the household of Cornelius in the name of Jesus. In the stead of Jesus. They saw him. When Israel recognizes the Gentile now, as the Gentile recognized Israel, and they see a Gentile ministry coming in the name of the Lord, then they will be saved, and their house will not be desolate, and it will happen according to Scripture. Um, according to Scripture, you will not see me again until you say. Blessed is he that cometh 
in the name of the Lord. Uh, all right? Does that correlate with the prodigal son? Which, which part of Chronicles? No, the prodigal son. Oh, the prodigal, I'm sorry. The prodigal son. Uh, it, it, it could be used, the prodigal son could be used in that, yes, that um, the younger son spent all of his living, and if you see the younger son as being Israel, that spent their living, spent all of their covenant, their, uh, their privilege, the purple fine linen they were clothed in and riotous and sumptuous living uh, for 2,000 years and they're living now with the swine which the Gentile is likened to the swine and Israel has been feeding from the swine they have been feeding with the swine uh, rich Israel the Israel that denies God not the Israel but acknowledges uh, Messiah the son but they've been feeding with the swine. They've been eating the husk. So in that sense, uh, they will look finally to the father's house and say, why am I here eating with the swine when in the father's house there's plenty? And they'll return. They'll come back to their mind, their right mind, and they'll return to the house. Now, how can the Gentile, if we're going to use this as a picture, a parable, um, how can the Gentile be then the uh, older son, the elder son that stays home? Um, in the scriptures, God recognized in Genesis 10 and 5 the isles of the Gentiles as nations before he recognized Israel as the seed of Abraham and then Jacob and then the 12 tribes and then Israel. See, first it was it was Jacob, then it was the twelve sons, then the twelve tribes, and Israel. But the Gentile was known of God. So in that sense we can liken him and show him. If you're using this parable, this way I use this parable more than one way. I don't use the parable when I first came to this body of people and uh, heard Brother Souders teaching and Brother Roberts teaching. Um, that was the way they used it. I used it that way for many years, but I have broadened my perspective of this parable, that God is showing a picture of all the backslidden, lost element of the church. And they are prodigal sons, and they must come back to the Father's house. and. And there, the elder son is the one that does not backslide, stays home, is with the father. Now, the problem with that is you can be a self-satisfied son in the house and become very, uh, uh, is the word I'm hunting for here, uh, very, um, you know, to where you want to hold on to everything. Dominic. You don't want to share. Stingy. Stingy, that's the word of You can become a stingy Christian in your mental attitude, and you'll have problems with the backslidden church being restored back to God because you'll say, well, why, Father, would you give them the ring? Why would you give them the best robe? Why would you kill the lamb, or in other words, offer the sacrifice for them? They're backslidden. They've gone away. They've wasted their living. Now, you can use, I can't. You may not be able to use it that way. I think both in the 16th chapter, when Jesus was speaking of the rich man and Lazarus, and he was speaking of the prodigal son, he simply, in the base understanding of that, speaking to the Jew and to the Gentile, and he's showing where the Jew had it all, had the covenant, was with God, was a rich man clothed in purple and fine linen, and Lazarus was the beggar. The Gentile was the beggar that was eating the crumbs that fell from the table outside the gate. The Gentile was not in the gate. And uh, Abraham's bosom being a picture of God's love 
the bosom uh, being showing the old covenant and the new covenant, the breast, the nourishment place of God, and Abraham's bosom. Notice it wasn't a woman's uh, anatomy that he spoke of there. He spoke of the man, Abraham's bosom, the man's bosom, the masculinity of God, the Father. And that's where Lazarus was placed. But for 2,000 years, the Jew has been in hell. That is, in the hell of judgment of the nations. And they're still wanting to wipe him off the map, wipe Israel off the map. The Iranian president said he should be exterminated. Uh, Israel should be exterminated uh, from the face of the earth. The nations are poised in their spirit to do that. God will not let them because uh, Israel is in hell, but he will get out of hell. The nation will come from hell and be restored. Now that's another way of looking at Christ's words in the 16th chapter and the 15th chapter. Uh, so uh, just uh, leaving that thought and going back to Luke 13 and 33 and 35, then I hope you, uh, I hope I haven't left you. I'm going to turn it to the choir here now, and it's past time, about 15 minutes over, and uh, so Sister Marla will make it up. Praise God, we'll make it up. Uh, and have you enjoyed the Bible study? Yeah, yeah. I hope that these Bible studies feed you, that you're nourished in them. Uh, I hope I didn't leave anyone with perplexity of understanding. Uh, if so, the next Monday night that we come together, get the question, have it ready, and we'll start off the, the Bible session next Monday night with your question on what you didn't understand in the pictures we've given you tonight of the character of Christ and his offering as a perfect offering for sin, his soul a perfect offering for sin. And these scriptures we dealt with in Luke the third day and uh, uh, the, the, the perfection of Christ, any of those things could be said. Uh, get, your, uh, get your mind tonight, don't let it leave you. I'm going to ask Brother Marlowe, ask the class a question next week when we come together. God bless you and give a good uh, uh, day uh, or night to you, whether the day is fast. I give you a good night and get ready for a good day tomorrow. God bless. Turn to your neighbor and